Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Bismillah. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'ufiruhu. Wa na'udhu billahi min shururi anfusina wa min sayyati amalina. Man yadihi allahu falamudilla lahu wa man yudlilhu falahadiyala. Wa ashadu an la ilaha illa Allah. Wahduhu la sharika lahu. Wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluhu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. All praise is due to Allah from whom we seek help and forgiveness. We seek refuge with Allah from the evil of our own souls and from our own bad deeds. Whomsoever Allah guides, no one can lead astray. Uh, whomsoever Allah guides will never be led astray. And whomsoever Allah leads astray, no one can guide. I bear witness that there is no God but Allah, the one having no partner. And I bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is Allah's servant and messenger. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu attaqullah haqqa tuqadihi wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimun. O ye who believe, be mindful of Allah. Be mindful of Allah in the way that Allah deserves and do not die except in a state of full submission to Allah. Subhanaka la ilma lana illa ma'alamtana innaka anta al-alim al-hakim. Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yasir li amri wa ahlul uqdata min lisani yafqahu qawli. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu everyone. Juma Mubarak. Um, today we'll be talking about uh, the topic that was put on the khutbah slide here was spiritual burnout and, and disconnect. I, I kind of want to focus a little bit more on uh, this aspect of abandonment and the feeling of abandonment uh, that sometimes accompanies that disconnect. So inshallah, let us begin that uh, oftentimes when we face spiritual disconnects or lows or burnouts, this is something that all of us face at some some way, shape, or form, and some point in our lives. Um, you know, oftentimes when we face these kind of lows of our spirituality uh, along our journey, the solutions or prescriptions that are often given to us, you know, are either something to do more of something which we're already struggling with, uh, like prayer. If you know, if you're saying that, hey, I'm really struggling connecting to God, or like I'm just not feeling that connection in prayer. Oftentimes, you know, someone may just say that, oh, you need to pray more, you need to do this more, and that's uh, you know, kind of missing the mark with respect to what we might need. Or it may be something else that might be too simplistic for a holistic problem. That hey, you know, I'm I'm struggling with something quite compound there's all these different things going on and a simplistic solution is given that oh you just need to like do more of this or you just need to do that or you need to stop doing this or whatnot and and very uh very much out of touch with respect to the problem holistically and so one uh you know one month we might be on a spiritual high like you know ramadan and might be doing great you might be praying all of your prayers you might be just in stride with your routine and having everything clicking for you spiritually you might just be really feeling it and then the next day or the next month or whatever it may be you wake up and it feels like it just starts to collapse things you know start to just unravel that one prayer gets delayed or missed and then you know all the things just start to waterfall and cascade after that the doubts with faith um you know seeing yourself as worthy or anything like that um having all these different disconnections really do arise oftentimes and it's not uncommon that it just it, it may happen after having kind of like a spiritual eye after being fairly connected um this these kinds of things happen uh not not just in in isolation or just completely uh without you know having some kind of peak at some point and so as we mentioned you know we might go down this path where we're missing you know not just our prayers but it, it starts to it starts to waterfall so that one missed prayer might lead to two missed prayers might lead to even more might lead to all of them being missed it may lead to engaging in uh, activities that are harmful for our spirituality but also for um, our social wellness our physical wellness it may also uh, continue to let ourselves slip down other paths that we go and ultimately we may feel disconnected we may feel not just disconnected with our spirituality we may feel disconnected with the people around us we may feel disconnected with ourselves and we ultimately struggle to climb back you know to gain some semblance of connection as we dig ourselves deeper into this hole as we continue to go down the slope um, but of course you know lapses like this don't often occur in a silo disconnects like this don't happen just on their own or solely with spirituality they're often accompanied by a lot of other deeper issues it's not just because your spirituality is you know you're just not feeling it theologically or 
um, that, you know, something is just not clicking on a spiritual level. But oftentimes, there's a lot of underlying issues, especially in our society today, that uh, have previously gone undiagnosed and previously have flown under the radar, such as, you know, depression, anxiety, or other psychological distresses and other issues in our life can exacerbate these issues we face in our spirituality, whether they are uh, friendships or relationships that are going through a hard time or that they don't work out, or whether it's a death in the family or a death of a loved one, some various traumas, different kinds of loss, changes, moving, whatever it may be, these can these have that effect of our spirituality. Again, we, we emphasize this point that our spirituality and our faith and our Islam is not just something that is contained within the binds of a book or not just something that we only do five times a day and is unaffected by everything else that we do, but it's something that is intrinsically tied to everything else that we do in life, how we choose to interact with people, how we choose to go about our day, how we do our work, how we interact act um, with the world around us. And so when we try to seek help for these issues, particularly spiritual disconnection, as I mentioned, you know, a lot of times, apart from the simplistic solution that's given, we're oftentimes shamed for the lapse. We're oftentimes shamed for that disconnect or having that struggle, guilted for feeling the way that we might, that it's, you know, because of some inherent flaw within ourselves or some shortcoming or something wrong with us, that uh, we're the uh, source of the problem and we're not the solution and that the solution is something outside of here. And, you know, it's, it's in times like this where we kind of get to the crux of what we'll talk about today, inshallah, of that we feel that abandonment. We don't just feel abandoned by the world around us. We feel a divine abandonment. We feel abandoned by God. We feel uh, unworthy of faith. We feel unworthy of being loved by God, that how can God, you know, love me, or uh, maybe God hates me, that God's forsaken me, and that, you know, we're not good enough for Islam. We're not good enough for God. And the slope only gets even more slippery as we give into it, you know, in these most vulnerable, difficult, disconnected moments, however, we'll find that though it might not seem like it, it's in these times when we can not only still have that opportunity to connect to Allah, but it's also that in those moments that Allah might actually be most connected and is still connected and even closer to us than we would have ever imagined. It's in these moments that our tears and our pains are just as valid as our prayers. Our authenticity is just as valid as our hope. That remember our Prophet ﷺ said when his child and his beloved uh, boy, his only boy that uh, came after prophethood, that, that survived, um, that was surviving and then passed away, his child Ibrahim, his baby boy, he said that on his passing that the eyes are weeping and the heart is broken, but the tongue is not going to utter that except which pleases God, that you can still be authentic to your emotions. You can still be authentic to the feelings. You don't have to bypass yourself. You don't have to gaslight yourself. You can still feel that. But at the end of the day, you conduct it as a Muslim, as someone with belief in a way that is still appropriate. And you can still hold the two to be true. And two stories for me come to mind from our tradition. And in both stories, we have complex situations and problems which result in literal isolation. And eventually, they spill over into feelings of spiritual abandonment and disconnect. And there's several stories that we can draw from here. But these are two that I personally re really connect with and I find a lot of comfort in. And though they end with the resolution, it doesn't erase the feelings or the struggle that these individuals felt or that they experienced, the fears that they had, the emotions that they were uh, expressing, and the real psychological and spiritual and physiological distress that they had uh, lived through, experienced, and had uh, gone through in this time. The first example comes from our mother, Hajar. Hajar was the mother of the Prophet Ismail, who was the son of Ibrahim, uh, and her experience in the Valley of Mecca, which uh, today we commemorate with the uh, with the sa'i or the running between the hills of Safa and Marwa when we go for Umrah, when we go for Hajj, 
Um, so many of us are familiar with this story of Hajar. We're familiar with her being taken into the valley of Mecca with her infant son, uh, Ismail, uh, by Ibrahim alayhi salam, um, and uh, being left into the valley, uh, left alone, um, just with, the, the, with themselves and uh, with maybe some meager provisions that were there, but uh, nothing much was there. And apart from the physical journey itself, the toll of that physical journey, this, uh, this uh, topography is one that's very unforgiving. It's very uh, much a desert. It's arid. There's no source of water. It's not an oasis by any means. It's a very harsh climate. And apart from the physical journey of just going to this place, the abandonment in the desert strikes a chord uh, when in the story, Hajar asks Ibrahim as he is, re as he is leaving, that if God had commanded this, did God order you to do this, Ibrahim? And he responds in the affirmative. And she responds back with her resolve. That's that, And her resolve strengthens uh, that God will not cause them to be lost. That Allah will not cause uh, our people to be just um, turned into oblivion. That Allah will not cause us to be lost. Yet, even when believing this, even when believing this and having the iman that she did, the faith that she did, the realities of a desperate situation readily kicked in. Her baby began to cry and was in need of water. She herself was probably very thirsty too. Their provisions were running out. Haja didn't just sit there, sitting in her resolve, knowing that Allah will not cause them to be lost and just try to pray her difficulty away. She herself knew that time was of the essence, that if she did not act, it could result in something that would be even further catastrophic. She hustled, she ran up and down and back and forth between two mountains. In the biblical narrative, there's a parallel to this story as well of Hajar uh, being taken or Hagar being taken by Abraham to the valley of, uh, I believe, a valley of Bekka. And in the biblical narrative, the story is a little different, but in it before, as we know, the angel comes, you know, and 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 you know comes and uh, reveals uh, the the miracle of Zamzam and and the water and the spring and all all of that. That in before the angel Gabriel comes to her, she hits her desperation moment and is sobbing in the biblical moment. She thinks to herself that she can't bear to watch her child die. So she puts her child under a bush to have some shade, but the child is crying and she doesn't know what she can do. And she just sits there really at her uh, at, at the end of her rope. And the, it's so beautiful that at that at that moment, the angel of God comes and a voice comes saying, Hajar or Hagar, what troubles you? Fear not, don't be afraid, and this kind of comfort. But imagine her pain. Imagine going from the statement at the beginning that God will not cause us to be lost to this feeling of abandonment and loss that I can't, I don't know if I can watch my child go, that I'm faced the reality that my child might perish in front of me and I don't know what might be happening, apart from all the other physical and psychological distress. Yet it was in this extreme situation, in the abandonment feeling, in the tears, where Hajar was reconnected. But her faith didn't make her haughty. It, it didn't make her think that, okay, we can just, you know, sit back here, relax. It's going to be a little rough, but, you know, God will take care of us and not do anything. She, it made her want to work even harder. It made her, uh, it didn't disconnect her from the realities of a very difficult and very troubling situation. She still understood she had a responsibility to do what she can. And oftentimes we say, uh, use the phrase of tie your camel um, that may often come to mind in situations like this. But she continued to work. She continued to run even though she knew it in her heart. But at the end, she was still having these feelings. She was still feeling abandoned, yet she was still not abandoned by God. She was even further connected. And not just that, she was met where she was. Allah didn't just come and, you know, throw a uh, rain shower and, and, and a flood to come. Allah came and consoled and, and comforted and provided what they needed and met them where they were. The next example is of our beloved Prophet Sallallahu and his experience early on in his prophethood and ministry that many of us are also familiar with the story of how the Prophet ﷺ early on in his uh, revelations and in his ministry, that there was a period in between his early revelations in which there was a gap. 
uh, which some scholars will say would range from anywhere from a few weeks to a few months to nearly a year or more, that there was a substantial notable gap at least between when one revelation came and the next revelation came. Uh, and yet oftentimes we skip over the difficulty, the situation not only could have, but did bring to the Prophet ﷺ. It was during this time and even before it that we know his message made him feel personally insecure, that he was going mad. Think about the first revelation he received, that he ran to his wife Khadija saying, cover me, cover me. I think I'm losing my mind. I think I'm going crazy. I think I'm cursed. I think I'm all these things. Think about those things. Think about the how uh, he was already even more withdrawing from society. He was kind of staying in his own space and you know just isolating and meditating. And think of what something like this, an experience like this would add. And so, you know, you see to add on to this that uh, in addition, you have these messages and then there's a, a gap, there's a pause, there's silence. And then there's just that discomfort that is there in those silence. And just imagine what might be going through the, man, the mind of someone who already was feeling a little insecure about what is happening with these um, really, you know, supernatural kind of occurrences within, uh, within uh, his life. And so some weaker reports also build on this. They relate that in, in, these, in these reports, how uh, the Prophet had thoughts to even go to a mountaintop, to go to a mountaintop and maybe even end it all. Most mainstream uh, will, will say that this was a little bit too far out. This isn't something the Prophet would have considered, but there are some of these, uh, these uh, more, you know, um, uh, th these more esoteric reports that are out there that uh, have the, these, these concepts. So you know, regardless of even if it didn't get to that extent, that whatever it was, we can assume that we can and see that this situation and the Prophet Sallallahu emotional um, well-being, his, uh, his, his spirituality, his, um, his, his focus in this area, um, and his distress had become very serious, that the feelings of abandonment were not just feelings anymore. They had become a lived experience to him. They had become a reality. And yet, despite this abandonment, he was still having these feelings, uh, and he was, he, and we can't discount the fact that at this time, throughout this time, that his rock, his support, his foundation, Khadija, was there for him, as we imagine that she was there for him after the first revelation, keeping him going, as well as his children, that despite the abandonment and despite these feelings he was having, he still had support that was there that uh, we don't talk about when we think about this gap. We don't talk about what was happening in between the lines. We talk about what we see manifest, but think about how after the first revelation, the process of Randa Khadija, she comforted him and she was there for him and helped build him back up. She connected him to her cousin, Waraka. She did all these different things. Now imagine who he's going back home to her every day. He's going back home to her uh, and imagine the comfort that she provides and the support that she provides and his children provide day after day after day. And yet, ultimately, we see all of this eventually culminated in the revelation after, after this gap had uh, kind of gone on and the, this had ceased that it culminated in the revelation of a very powerful surah, the surah of uh, Surah Doha, that in which Allah tells the Prophet ﷺ immediately that your Lord has not forsaken you nor abandoned you, that did he not find you an orphan and guide you and what comes after for you is better than what is at your presence. Think about in each of these, it, they're beautiful verses, but they address the Prophet Sallallahu situation that, the, that your Lord has not forsaken you. Thinking about maybe the Prophet Sallallahu was having these thoughts that does Allah, has Allah forsaken me? Am I cursed? Did I do something wrong? What, think about all these different things that could lead him to feeling disconnected from his creator. Your Lord has not abandoned you. Thinking that the Prophet may have had that thought that I, I'm, I'm, I've been abandoned, that I, I, I don't know if Allah is happy with me or pleased with me or displeased with me and that I, I've been abandoned, that your Lord has not abandoned you. Did he not find you an orphan and guided you, connecting to the Prophet and who he was and where he had come from, that your hereafter and the time to come after will be better for you than the present, recognizing this present uh, situation is not a great situation, but comforting that in the hope of what is to come, the, that Allah met the Prophet where he was, not just where he was, but also who he was, and gave him an inspiration of being who he could be and who he would be afterwards.
So in conclusion, wherever we might be in our spiritual journeys in life or at the moment, especially if we're feeling disconnected or abandoned by our faith or our God or the world around us, we should know that in these moments, we shouldn't gaslight or spiritually bypass ourselves. We shouldn't just uh, just not be honest with ourselves with the reality of the difficulty we're facing and, and just solely think that we are the, the problem in this and we are the only reason, we are the only, um, you know, uh, problematic thing within this whole equation that we should be honest with ourselves yet we might st we should still find a way to keep ourselves moving forward still find a way to still uh physically move forward spiritually move forward even if we feel that we can't anymore we we have to be sure to keep our mind on continuing keep moving hajar salam kept running the Prophet ﷺ kept hoping, kept praying, despite the difficulty of the emotional weight of what they're facing, the physical toll, the unforgiving environment, all these different things of what they're facing. And still for the bulk of their trials and their situations, they struggled. Ultimately, respite did come. Respite came and it met them where they were. And though they were okay at the end, and they were connected at the end, it didn't erase the fact that they struggled and that in their struggle, came the same gems that we still hold today and we are inspired by and we resonate with, but that their struggle made them into not just the people that they feared to become, not the people that they had feared that they would become lost and abandoned, but the ones who they ended up needing to be, not just for themselves, but the world around them and for generations to come. So when we're experiencing a spiritual or psychological distress, we often do one of four things to cope. We often turn to prayer, worship, and, and to a connection with Allah. We often turn to our loved ones for support. We may gain awareness or meditate on our own struggles and understanding of ourselves. And so we sit with ourselves for a little bit, or we may change our routine, our diet, or exercise. But often we do just one of these things, thinking that it will fix everything. Yet, as we see from the stories shared and from the nature of these distresses and compli uh, complicated solution uh, situations like these, that these complicated situations require holistic approaches. Both the Prophet ﷺ and Hajar had turned to worship and they kept it consistent. They still did not abandon that aspect of their prayer and connection to Allah, as we see in both of their stories. They still turned to their loved ones for support, even though in Hajar's case, she just had her baby Ismail. Uh, a mother can only attest to how uh, comforting it is to just have her child there with her. If her child was lost or abandoned, what is that? Uh, what what would be the state in that and the emotional state? But to have her child at least there, to know that her 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 baby is there and she can still be with that child, offers that kind of support. And the process of having his family and having his wife, even though the society around him would eventually become hostile to him. That they tried to make sense of it themselves. That we know the Prophet was someone who meditated uh, for times and times on his own. He would isolate himself. And we know Hajar just maybe had had those moments where she just sat with herself and she just tried to make sense of it. But they also tried to change their routines. And uh, they also, you know, Hajar got up and started running. The Prophet maybe thought about doing some other things. We, we see those in some of the reports, but uh, we, we probably see trying to do something different. And yet it wasn't one single thing that helped them, but a combination of each of these things before the divine intervention came. They Not only did they tie their camel, they put the knot in, they did all the work, they put in everything uh, to holistically tie this camel before just simply saying that we'll just let uh, Allah do what Allah does and you know not, not do anything about it ourselves. So my message here for all of us is to keep pushing, to keep moving as difficult and as sluggish a spiritual disconnect, burnout, and abandonment feeling puts us in. How, how, however difficult it, it may feel, we need to keep moving. Spiritual disconnection, burnout, and abandonment is and it can feel debilitating. You want to give up. You want to maybe just unravel and feel that you can't do anything about it. So why do anything? But ultimately, you start to point the fingers at yourself and the world around you. And you start to just isolate yourself in different ways and not see yourself as worthy, not see yourself as sacred and not see your faith as accepting of you or you as your of your faith. And so you start to live into a bubble and, and, and it really becomes difficult to continue to move on. And Martin Luther King once said in the context of the civil rights movement that, you know, if you can't fly, then run. And if you can't run, then walk. 
And if you can't walk, then crawl. But whatever you do, you have to keep moving forward. Be sure that even in these moments, it's even uh, to not be afraid to ask for help. That sometimes within us, we have the solution that we oftentimes have what we need right within us. But sometimes we need the help of someone else to help activate that. A spiritual guide, an imam, a counselor, a chaplain, a teacher, someone, a, a psychologist, a, a therapist, whoever it may be, someone to help you in that time of need. Don't be afraid to ask for help. None of these, uh, these holy figures that we talk about were ever afraid to ask for help. So asking for help as well, even if we may have all of those solutions in us, someone to help us along the way, a friend, a confidant, whoever it may be, to help us just get out of that rut. So don't just pray and think that that's enough. Don't just rely on others and think that that's enough. Don't just isolate yourself from the world and think that that's enough. Don't just make changes in your lifestyle and your diet and exercise and think that that is enough. None of these things are enough without each other. Missing, they're like missing pieces to each other. And know that in the feelings of abandonment, in the times that we feel abandonment, that the reality of it may be that though we are in, this, in feeling this abandonment, the reality of it is that Allah is in fact and may even be closer and closest to us than we had ever imagined. We just need to open our eyes to that, to that possibility. We ask Allah as we close here to guide us, guide us all, regardless of who we might be, to the right path, the path of whom Allah has bestowed his favor, and not the path of those who have incurred Allah's displeasure. We allow Allah to uh, we ask Allah to allow us to continue in the follow in the footsteps of the Prophet of Hajar and of all of our uh, sacred predecessors who would come, uh, even though we'll, inev we'll inevitably stumble. We're going to wander off the path to help us see the light of these shining beacons in our respective journeys, to help us model our characters and our struggles in their, in their way, uh, to allow us to be mindful of Allah in every step and action that we take, every prayer that we make, and that we do it for Allah's sake alone. And we ask Allah to keep our families, our loved ones, close to Allah and to help us be there for them as the Prophet ﷺ and as Hajar was for their families. And so we ask Allah also to keep all who are oppressed, persecuted, hurt, protected, allow us to be their helpers, to bestow upon us knowledge and opportunities to grow, relief for when we feel stuck, and uh, respite for when we feel uh, the pain of, of abandonment and isolation and make the path of our faith and our life easy. And so allow us to leave this Juma inshallah better than we came into it, inshallah. Ameen. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad kama salli ala Ibrahima wa ala ali Ibrahima inna ka hamid majid rabbana taqabbal minna inna ka anta sameel alim rabbana wa taqabbal dua. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Again, a blessed Juma to you and to your families. Thank mm -hmm. you.